Hi, I'm Richard Mellon, host and producer of Thompson Centre's Outdoor Quest TV. We're currently in our fifth year of broadcast, and Argo has been with us since the very beginning. But my personal history with Argo goes back over 30 years. It was the mid-70s when I rode in my first Argo. In that time, Argo has been part of my family, our outdoors tradition, and our enjoyment of the outdoors, and we've watched it evolve into today's ultimate machine, the Avenger. So why don't you sit back and come along on a video adventure with me, and I'll show you how I use the Argo in my day-to-day -day job of filming a hunting show. One of the facts of life today is that good hunting is seldom found alongside a road. Whether it is filming a TV show or a trip with friends and family, getting away from the crowds is important, not only for the success of the hunt, but to improve the overall quality of the outdoors experience. The ability to leave the roads and crowds far behind is what first drew us to the Argo. Getting away from it all is only half of the equation. Once there, the Argo allows you to hunt wherever the game is without worrying about how you're going to get it out. Let's take a look at my whitetail buck hunt from this year. You'll see the important role that the Argo Avenger played in recovering it. This is alfalfa. And usually here in uh, northern Alberta, they get two cuts on uh, an alfalfa crop, two cuts in, in a season. The first crop is usually grows the tallest, they get the most volume off it, but the second crop has the most protein. So this is the, would have been a second cut and it hasn't been cut. This makes this whole quarter section here, the 160 acres, one giant food plot for deer. This is uh, 16 to 18 percent protein, so it is a huge attractant for deer. And even though we're hunting bucks in the rut, where the does are, the bucks are. Look at, look at how many trees are rubbed right here on this corner. And then we got a big, big scrape right here. I think tonight's going to be good. I gotta be gone. I guess I could hunt tomorrow morning too. I gotta be gone. I gotta be to my next hunt by tomorrow evening. So I haven't got a lot of time left. I guess tonight's the night then. There we go. What do we got? Those. Those are out already. I got a couple of, of little does up off to my right. I got uh, a doe and a, two does and a fawn off to my, my left here. And uh, there's nothing better than having bait in the field, is there? <laughs> there we go. I just saw a flash of horns. Just a flash of horns back in the trees here. There's two, maybe three bucks in there. I can, I can see the horns as they, as they're rubbing, but I can't see the the deer. Right. There's a white ear. Well, it's been half an hour since I've seen those bucks. And one doe came back out, but the uh, I haven't seen the box again. There's one. Well, he's not a bad little five by five. I think he might come out. Yeah. Yeah, he's moving down to where the does have all jumped and crossed. There he comes. There he comes. I better get ready. Look at how pretty he is. Ten in his lick branch. He's got, he's got a scrape line. I don't know how many bucks are here, mind you, but there are scrape lines and rubs all the way up and down the field. I pushed it far enough. I hit him hard. I guess we need to uh, go see what we got. This is the scrape he was tending. He took off this way here, so let's go take a look. Oh, here he is, right here. There he is. <laughs> Oh, 
look at that. What a pretty buck. What a pretty, pretty buck. He's a nice five by, by six. There's a sixth sticker point over here that I didn't know about. He's uh, in great shape. This is early. This is only the, the 3rd of November. And the rut's not going to peak for about two weeks. But he was sure interested in all those does. Drug him out so early in the afternoon. You know, he came out by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And dark is until 6.30 around here. So he's out two and a half hours early. Just a uh, great time of the year for this. Uh, you know, he's obviously a, a younger buck. And uh, he's a little more eager than the old boys are. But it, uh, it is uh, something that you don't want to overlook is the opportunity to hunt hunt in the early afternoon. I was set up in my blind by 2 o'clock and by 20 after 2 I had uh, does out and around, seen a little a little buck down the field chasing off a, another doe so you can't start too early when when this time of the year rolls around and you know I mean the, it's not like the rut is an actual date on the calendar they can they can start a little bit earlier or, or run a little bit later but uh, that's a nice little buck and I'm, I'm right happy with them 50 cal Encore uh, did the job again, 250 grain SST, and it was all over. Just about Florida right on the spot there. I was surprised that he actually had it enough together to get over the fence like he did, but he made it over. I got a bunch of work to do getting him out. Well, that's the beautiful thing about having a machine like the Argo. I don't ever have to think about where I'm hunting. Uh, the field that I shot that, that buck in yesterday is uh, actually kind of remote. We've got to go back through, through the, the trees here a bit. Uh, uh, it's one of those, those quarters that's surrounded by crown land or by, by uh, government-owned land. And uh, you know, there's a little bit of swamp and, and wet stuff. I mean, it was yesterday anyway when we walked in in the afternoon to set up. Uh, I got my feet wet, <laughs> uh, but it got really cold last night. It froze really hard, so probably, uh, you know, it's going to be ice. I don't know. I got the tracks on here on the Argo, which uh, uh, the machine puts down less than one pound per square foot of ground pressure, which is just fabulous. I mean, that's practically floating. I mean, it goes across the snow, right? So I don't have to worry. If it's frozen, we won't have to worry about bur breaking through. Uh, if it's wet, we'll just keep on going. I mean, it's amphibious. guys were right. This wasn't going to be attempted in the dark. Well, now it's starting to snow pretty serious. Just in time to hit the road. <laughs> it never fails. Anyway, I'd really like to thank you for joining me today on my, my quest for Northern Alberta Whitetail. If you're interested in booking a hunt with Smoky River Outfitting, all this contact information will be at the end of the show, or you can join us online at theoutdoorquest.com. Bringing our family up in the outdoors has always been important to Sandy and I. Each of our children enjoys hunting, and it has been some of my proudest moments to guide each to their first animals. Let us follow along with Jake, our youngest, on his first ever black bear hunt with a muzzleloader. Hi, welcome to Outdoor Quest Television. I'm Sandy Mellon, and I'm on a black bear hunt with my youngest son, Jake, for the next couple of nights. Now, Jake just got back from school. He only has two nights to hunt. And we've got a choice of a couple of baits here. So what we're going to do is uh, get in the Argo. It's really wet back in here. And we're going to go and see what kind of action these next couple of baits have got. Um, we're going to check this one first. And then there's another one a little ways away that we're going to get on and see uh, which one has the most sign and which one we should spend our time with. So, Jake, how about it? Let's get going. Northern Alberta is both beautiful and nasty at the same time in the spring. Getting around can be a huge chore. When you need to haul a lot of gear, people, or bait around, nothing compares to the Argo for ease or comfort. Well, this is the first of two baits that uh, Greg has going for us. 
and uh, we went, we came in and re uh, restocked this bait last night. So something's been in here, all right. You've been in the dog food that's in that one. There's definitely something here, but this is not a great area for getting any idea of tracks or anything like that, so that we have an idea of size. But uh, it is getting hit, so we may uh, we may have to sit here tonight. But we're going to go and check the second bait before we make a decision. This is as far as we're going with the Argo. We've got a ways to walk back in here. It's a little wet and mushy, but um, the second bait's back in here, so we're going to see how much sign is back here. There's lots of sign back here. Our stand is just up here. We'll have a great look at things. So, uh, we should get up there and get set up. Well, I know you're primed up and ready to go, so... We'll, uh, I don't know, it could happen now, it could be three, four hours from now, who knows. Mm -hmm. But, definitely should be lots of action. Look at this guy come in, Jake. He's little. Look how his backside's all rubbed. He's been definitely rubbing up against a tree or something. There's no one. Yeah. He's, like he's limping. Oh, well, he's definitely weary. Definitely. I mean, take that home and slump in there. He looks a bit bigger. And he's got a better coat on. The other guy's been rubbing a lot. Yeah. I'd go with that. Make a good shot on him. Good shot, buddy. That was awesome. Jake. All right. That was a... Oh, he's a nice bear. He's got some good hide on him. Make a fine little rug. I think you make a great rug, you betcha. It was worth sitting through all these bugs up here, <laughs> hey? Oh, got eight alive myself. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Good job. Good job. Oh, Jake, oh. <laughs> he's great. Good job. Oh, he's a great bear. Great little bear. Well, Jake, we better get the Argo. Yeah. Because we're losing light really fast here, so we'll get him out of here and uh, oh, go celebrate. <laughs> That's awesome. Good job. Okay, you get the heavy in there, lad. Let's get him in. Oh, Jake. Good job. <laughs> well, Jake, he's going to make a great rug. Skinned out nice. He's got good hide. So uh, he's going to look great in your living room. That he will. He's going to look great in there. And this is the second animal you've taken with an Omega now. So is that on your Christmas list for this year? No, I think the Encore is on the Christmas list. I like the black powder, but I also like the 300 mag for it. Well, now we know. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us on this episode of The Outdoor Quest for Black Bear in Northern Alberta. Hi, I'm TJ Schwanke, host of Thompson Center's Outdoor Quest. Living and producing our television series in some of the most remote and rugged country in the world certainly has its challenges. Whether it's hauling a moose out of a muskeg swamp, cruising cut lines in search of spring bears, or heading back into a remote basin in the Rocky Mountains, our Argo is absolutely indispensable. But the Argo's versatility doesn't end there. It's not all hunting and fishing here at Thompson Center's Outdoor Quest. On weekends, the Argo becomes a real workhorse. Whether I'm putting in some new fence on the acreage, or cutting up a supply of wood for the winter, the Argo is a critical tool to get the job done right. Why don't you sit back and enjoy a couple of our recent adventures with the Argo. The first is a hunt for trophy mule deer in the Peace region of Alberta. And the second sees me enjoying some hot walleye action on a southern Alberta reservoir. Hey, glad you could stay with us on Outdoor Quest Television. I'm TJ Schwanke. Today we're doing something a little different. We're hunting mule deer. We're in northern Alberta up in the Peace region. It's a special draw area. There's some really, really good bucks up here. Now this region has been just deluged with rain here for the past few months, and you literally can't get around anywhere. There's just water laying everywhere. The roads are out. All the cut lines that people usually drive down, they can't even get quads down. Now we have a little bit of an advantage today. 
we got the Argo with us. So we're going back into some uh, agricultural fields way back in the back here. There's some clover fields, some hay fields, and uh, I'm pretty sure the mule deer are going to be eaten back there. There's a lot of mule deer in this region, and it's just mid-September right now, so the bucks are going to still be in big groups. Uh, I got a bit of an obstacle in front of me here right now. I got to cross this beaver dam, going to head down that cut line, and then at the end of that line, there's some agricultural fields. We're going to set up, do some glass, and hopefully find some big deer. Stay with us. This is going to be really exciting. I just give it traction. I'm just gonna leave the Argo here. Go on on foot. It's it's not just too far up here where there's a big clover field and I think with any luck that should be some deer out. Yeah, there's some deer out there. Oh there's a good one. There's a good one there. Well, that was easy, almost too easy. Sometimes it scares me. The big buck's kind of towards the back of the group, which is really good. Three hundred and twenty-seven yards, still a little far for the muzzle loader, that's for sure. But I think I can get a little closer. I think what I'm going to do. Let's use some of this cover here. I'm going to belly crawl out there and try and get around 200 yards away from those deer and just sit there and wait for him to stand up. There's not much else we can do. I don't want to spook him at all because I want him to stand up on his own. I can just see his antlers is all I can see and every once in a while he'll lay his head right down sideways and I can't see anything. Boy, if you didn't know he was there, you'd just think that was some weeds sticking up in the trees, that's for sure. Wow, I can't believe how long he's been laying there. It's gotta be at least an hour and a half. He hasn't moved. I mean, his head's been up and down a couple times, but some of the other deer have stood up. Usually I don't have this much patience, but on a big buck like this, there's not much else you can do except wait. I mean, I know he's gonna stand up. If I don't spook him, he should have all day. Okay, he's up, he's up. And, uh, Turn just a little bit. 222 yards. Long shot, but I'm pretty confident with it. I'm doing lots of work at the range. Okay, thank you. I just need him to turn. All right. Yes. <laughs> Where did he go down? <laughs> 222 yards, can you believe that? Incredible. I think he's down for good. Let's go see what we did. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Beautiful buck. It's a great thing hearing about Alberta. Since they put these mule deer on limited entry draw, our bucks have just increased in size something dramatically. Look at the size of him. Beautiful four point. He's got eye guards. It's kind of interesting. We've been seeing a lot of bucks here all week, and some of them have been in velvet, some of them have been half shed out. It looks like this guy's been shed for quite a while. His uh, antlers are nice and dark, and, but just a beautiful old, old deer. 222 yards with the Omega. Uh, you know, this is a general rifle season here. I didn't have to use the muzzle loader, but I'll tell you what, shooting this Omega, I don't feel the slightest bit handicapped. Shooting 150 grains of Pyrodex pellets, uh, 350 grain pellets, over top of a 250 grain shockwave bullet, and Held right on him, and you saw what happened. Probably saw better than I saw. The smoke was pretty thick till once it cleared, I saw him fall, but uh, beautiful, beautiful buck. Well, as you saw on the journey in here, she was a little rough getting here, and we've got a long trip out of here, and the sun's starting to get a little low on the horizon. Well, I'm gonna go get that Argo and get you out of here, big boy. Guessing, I wanna be careful dropping into it. It's pretty deep. There we go, we're floating. I can't believe we got all the way back in here. Sure wouldn't have done this without the Argo. End of the cut line and I'm out of here. Hey, welcome to the Outdoor Quest. I'm TJ Schwanke. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're 
It's going to be slip bobber fishing for walleye, but we're kind of at a remote lake here. It's, uh, it's been quite the trip in here. There we go. It's always a good idea to wear a life jacket anytime you're on the water, whether it be in a boat or an amphibious vehicle like our Argo here. Let's go see what we can do. I'm looking forward to this. Now, it's one of those lakes that doesn't get fished a lot, and uh, it's not like there's any really big fish in here, but it's always fun to get out and do a little bit of fishing and take home a few fish with a frying pan. I'm just setting my depth. It's important. I like to have my jig so it's just about a six inches or eight inches off the bottom. I'm fishing the walleye flasher today, and it's a, we got some waves going, so it's just super. That little blade beneath the flasher just goes. Whoa! <laughs> I hate when that happens. I can't count how many times that has happened, though. You're just setting the depth, and uh, you get a bite. But really important, you know, that that uh, jig's down there. That blade's just swinging back and whoa! This feels like a pretty good fish. The blade's just swinging back and forth. And really enticing to those fish. I'm using minnows for bait today, dead minnows. And that's the great thing about this walleye flasher jig is, whoa, it's just a good walleye. Not many big walleye in this lake, but I got a dandy here, I hope. Oh, yes. Right. That is a super fish for this lake. Oh, look at that. What a beauty. Oh, right in the roof of the mouth. Good thing I got that hook set. Ah. That's really buried in there. There we go. Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful walleye. Oh, he's got some attitude too, doesn't he? There we go. That one's down again. No big hurry here. Let it stay down. I usually like to count to five or even ten sometimes. Just reel up that slack slowly. Once you feel the weight, give it to him. Whoa, he was really swimming. Now, there's a real trick there. When these fish bite these slip bobbers, if they stay in one spot, typically means there isn't a lot of fish there, but if they take off once they bite it, what that usually means is there's a big school of fish down there. They're trying to grab the prey and get out of there. So when he takes off like that, that's a pretty good sign to me that I'm where I need to be. Now the great thing about these slip bobbers is you see how it slides on the line. The line slides freely through it. And I'll show you how that works in a minute, but the big thing about that is I can fish any depth. I'm in 23 feet of water here, not somewhere you could fish with a normal clip-on bobber, but with the slip bobber, I never have to reel in more than a couple inches of line. There's the... There's the knot, so he's only 20 some feet away now. Feels like another decent fish. You know, fishing slip bobbers is just so much fun it's, uh, and productive. But, you know, we got a great, it's a hot, hot afternoon here. Just a great day to come into a remote lake like this, just kick back a little bit. Watch the bobber and wait for it to go down, which it did right there. Now, this fish here, unfortunately, for him that is, is about the perfect size for the fry pan, so. That's where he's gonna go. I do love eating walleye though. I'm just gonna put him down here. And I'm gonna get back out there quickly because I'm pretty sure there's another fish, but I'll show you this bobber here real quick before I do that. You can see how it doesn't actually attach the line. It slides freely on there. I've got that walleye flasher jig underneath and I've been using a minnow on there for bait. And up on my line, I've got a bobber stop and I've just tied this out of 20 pound dacker on line so what happens is when I cast this out on the water, it lands on the water and the line just goes through, goes through, goes through until that bobber stop comes up to rest against it. And that's what controls my depth. Okay, look at that, look at that. That bobber's on its side. Now that would lead you to believe that the jig was laying on the bottom, but it's not, I know it's not. What happened is, is a fish has picked up the, the jig rather than swimming away with it, he swam up with it, took the weight off the bobber and it laid on its side. So really important to watch that. Man, it doesn't feel like a bad fish at all again. I'm really happy with the fish we're catching here today. You know, it's a great thing about this Argo. Uh, you know, there's people come in here in the summertime. It's a real spot for ice fishing because, you know, people can snowmobile in or things like that. But pretty hard to get a boat in here. I mean, I have seen people drag boats and canoes in here, but it's a tough trip. And the uh, great thing about this is you drive your boat in here. So it doesn't get much better than that. Oh, good net job there. There we go. Another beautiful, beautiful walleye, though. This, uh, this Argo Avenger is brand new this year, and it's just an awesome machine. I'm sure you saw this with the Conquest last year, but uh, I really like this machine. A little bigger tires on it, uh, goes a little faster, just a better machine all around, I think. A little different steering system on it. Nice, nice walleye. Well, one more for the fry pan, and I think we're going to call it a day. With the addition of tracks, the Argo becomes a true four-season ATV with the ability to cross the deepest snow, all the while keeping us warm inside the convertible top. 
Reliable, versatile, safe, and comfortable, Argo is the only true all-terrain vehicle on the market today that really does it all. Is it any wonder we rely upon the Argo to get our job done every day?